Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, good to have everybody back, and we can get started now on our third program this afternoon. And for those of you joining us in television, if this is the first time you're catching us, why, well, we're just an informal Bible study. And uh, our only goal is to get folks to study their own Bible on their own and uh, get over the idea that you can't understand it. Because if you know how to open it up, rightly divide it, as we call it, and uh, keep some of these areas separated one from the other, it's... Uh, really not that difficult. And uh, so that's really our approach now in this series of programs is to show why this dispensation of the grace of God is so uniquely different <clears throat> from all the rest of Scripture. Yeah, I always use the word, it's insulated. It is just literally insulated from all the rest of Scripture because it is something that none of the rest of the Bible, boy, that's awful English, isn't it? No other part of the Bible has any reference to it. that You can't find it, but only through the revelation given to the Apostle Paul. So that's what we're uh, honing in on for these series of programs. Okay, my little wife is the one who always keeps things on track. <clears throat> she just reminded me to, again, remind our listening audience of the one and only book that we have produced, and it's 88 questions, and uh, the answers were taken from our television program. And then uh, she just told me, I don't even know a lot of these things are going on. We get so many phone calls asking if we have something that is just particular related to Paul. Well, I would have never thought of it, but she did. <clears throat> and that was our Aegean cruise a couple years ago. And uh, all of our Bible lessons were in answer to the question, why Paul? And uh, I'd just like to remind even you today, why the Apostle Paul? Jesus had 12. They had the Old Testament prophets. And John had already written Revelation. <clears throat> Why do we need the Apostle Paul? Well, we answer that in a series of eight hours on, uh, on our GM cruise. And uh, it's been, again, well received. Otherwise, we wouldn't even suggest people to buy it. But uh, it's well worth the few bucks that uh, we asked for that one. All right, now we're going to keep right on with where we've been all afternoon on this dispensation of the grace of God and why it is so different <clears throat> from everything else in Scripture. Come back with me now to Colossians chapter 1, dropping in at verse 24. And remember that way back in the previous taping, we put the four references in the New Testament that use this word dispensation so that someone doesn't come and say, well, that's not even a biblical word. Oh, yes, it is. And uh, it's Holy Spirit inspired. And uh, it means what it says, and it says what it means. It's a period of time during which God is dealing with the human race under its own set of directions. Totally different from the directions under the law. Totally different than the directions that God did with Adam and Eve or even some of the other Old Testament economies. But here in Colossians now, the apostle of the Gentiles is writing to Gentiles. <clears throat> and uh, verse 24, where he, I should read the verse, last part of verse 23. I, Paul, am made a minister. Now let me st just happen to think. Come back with me. Keep your hand here. This is what I call Bible study. <clears throat> Romans chapter 15 a verse that we've used a lot of times in other circumstances. But the same word. See, and that's what I like people to learn to do. It compares words with words. And uh, if it means one thing in one place, it means the same thing in another place. It's the same word. In Romans 15, verse 8. <clears throat> Romans 15, verse 8. You'll recognize it as soon as you see it. Paul says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a what? A minister. See? A sent one. But he was a minister of the circumcision, Israel, for the truth of God to confirm or to bring to fruition or to fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Now that was the purpose of Christ's ministry in coming to the nation of Israel at his first advent. All right, now back here at Colossians then, Paul too is a sent one, but 
not to Israel, but to the Gentile world. See, and that's what I want folk to see, that you don't just jumble this all up together. Christ had his ministry to Israel. This man's ministry is to the non-Jewish world. All right, so he says in verse 23 again, I, Paul, am made a minister. By whom? By the ascended Christ. He's the one that designated him. He's the one who spoke to Ananias back there in Acts chapter 9. And what did he tell him? Don't be afraid of him, Ananias. I'm going to send this man far hence to the Gentiles. So that's been the name of the game since it started. All right, now verse 24. Who? This minister of the grace of God, this apostle Paul. <clears throat> and I rejoice in my sufferings for you. What's he talking about? Well, you see, he's about at the end of his ministry. He's in prison in Rome. And even though he may have had a short uh, respite where he came out of prison for a little bit, one long, they arrested him a second time. And uh, that went on, of course, to his martyrdom. But uh, when you realize that his suffering, and again, I'm going to use it, even though I've used it many times before. Come back with me to Second Corinthians chapter 11, because I know I've got people out there in TV land that have no idea of what he's talking about. They don't have a clue how this man suffered for the sake of the gospel the whole 24, 25 years of his ministry without a let up, constantly under all the pressures of the persecution from the Jew and from the pagans, the, the vagaries of weather, the tempest of sea, all part of his ministry. And uh, he couldn't just take a flight from Athens to Rome or from there. Every most, almost all of it was either on foot or by ship. All right, he got 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> and he does this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to confront the Corinthian church for not recognizing his apostleship. They too, just like today, they were putting him down. Well, who are you? See, Jesus we know, Peter we know, Apollos we know, but who are you? Well, he was the one that brought them out of paganism. They should have known him. All right, so now in chapter 11, he defends his apostleship. <clears throat> All right, verse 22, in reference to the 12, who, of course, were the kingpins of everything because of the three years that they had spent with Jesus in his earthly ministry. Now, you've got to remember the time factor here. That wasn't all that long ago. All right, verse 22. Are they the twelve Hebrews? <clears throat> so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. And I think he could have just well said, are they Jews? So am I. So I usually use this verse to prove that all these terms used throughout Scripture all meant the same people, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. All right? But that's not what I want to make the point. Verse 23, are they, the twelve, Apollos, are they ministers of Christ? Now here comes the man's humility. Even though it was inspired, he hated to do this. I know he did. I am more. More what? The minister of Christ. In labor, more abundant. Well, he did more in one year than the twelve did in however many years they lived until they were martyred. There's no record of how much the twelve accomplished after Israel rejected everything. Not that much. All right, but here he is, labored amongst the Gentiles with fruit like we will never understand till we get to glory. <clears throat> so he says, I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes, that is, the stripes of the, the scourgings, the cat and nine tails, as we call them, stripes above measure, in prisons, more frequent, in deaths, now that's plural, so it was near death. Not that he died over and over, but that he was so close to death over and over. <clears throat> Verse 24, of the Jews, five times I received the 40 stripes, save one, the 39. Five times. 
few men could survive one. And he went through five of them. Three times I was beaten with rods. That was unmerciful. Again, we can't comprehend what it was to be beaten with those rods. Once he was stoned up there in what is present-day Turkey in Asia Minor, out of the town, I think it was Derby and Lystra. They drug him out like a dead horse, literally dragged him out of the city for dead. All right, three times I suffered shipwreck. And you've got to remember, they didn't have helicopters and search planes. They were out there on the ocean with probably little hope of ever being found. But three times he was uh, shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And then in the day-to-day -day part of his ministry, in journeyings or traveling often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, perils by my own countrymen, the Jew, in perils by the heathen, that is, the Greeks and the Romans or anybody else, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings, in other words, I suppose, almost in fear of his life being taken, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and naked. Not a very pretty lifestyle, was it? How many preachers today would do it? Mm -mm. No, if they can't jet someplace, they're not going to go. But oh, how this man suffered and suffered and suffered. And then on top of all that, the care of all the churches or these little assemblies of his believers. Okay, come back to Colossians now then. I've reminded you of what he's talking about when he speaks of the afflictions in his flesh for the sake of the body of Christ, which is the church. <clears throat> now verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Almost a carbon copy of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. And what was the dispensation? That set of directions that now make the composite body of Christ what it is. We are all one in Christ. We've all been saved by the same gospel. We are all under the same set of directions for walking, the Christian walk. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. But this is all part now of what Paul refers to as the directions for the dispensation of the grace of God. See? All right, now then verse 26. Even the mystery. See how over and over this word pops up in his writings? Even the mystery or this secret which has been hid. Now you remember, oh, we've got to do this again. That's the only way you learn. I don't care if I do over, over, and over, and over. Go back to Luke 18. Luke 18. We looked at it the last time we were together taping. But... Uh, you, you've got to learn how to just almost memorize these things and be ready to use them. Because, see, this is what most of Christendom, your Sunday school classes, they can't get it through their head that all these things were supernaturally kept secret until God revealed it in His own time. And that's where His sovereignty comes in. That's what He said back in Exodus 19. All the earth is mine. I can do whatever I want. It's mine, see? All right, now look what happened in Luke 18. For those of you out in television, in case you missed this program, why, here it is. Verse 31, the end of his earthly ministry, and they're up in northern Israel, and they're about ready to go back south to Jerusalem, the Passover, the crucifixion, and all that followed. All right? Verse 31 of Luke 18. <clears throat> then he took unto him the twelve, the original twelve disciples, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, do you see what he said? Everything that was written back there in the Old Testament concerning him are about to be fulfilled. That's what he's telling them. But they don't know what he's talking about. Those things were so hidden in the Old Testament that 
the, the ordinary, everyday reader never caught it. But Jesus knew they were there. All right, so he said, it shall be accomplished. Now verse 32. He's going to remind them of what the Old Testament prophesied. For he shall be delivered to the Gentiles. That's the Romans. And he shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him. Well, who did all that? The Romans. Now, when we take our tours to Israel, we usually, not always, but we usually try to start where they began his taunting and his beating and playing games with them. See, the Roman soldiers actually had a series of, of circles drawn in the stone. It was just almost like tic-tac-toe. And they would make games with their prisoners, and Christ was no different. And they would just taunt them and torture them and everything. And that was even before he came out and made his way in what the uh, Catholics like to practice is the Stations of the Cross. But nevertheless, it was up there at the beginning of his walk to Calvary that these Romans accomplished all this. See, they mocked him and they mistreated him. They spit on him. They scourged him. And then verse 33, and they'll put him to death. Now, he doesn't say they'll crucify him. He just says, and they'll put him to death. And then, the third day he shall rise again, speaking of his resurrection. Now, it's all plain English, isn't it? But now, don't stop there. Read the next verse. And they, the twelve, these twelve men who've been with him now for three years, you'd almost think that they could interpret anything he said by now. But they understood. What's the next word? None. Not a word of this did they understand. And this saying was, there's the word again, what? Hid. How do I always follow that? Who hid it? Well, God did. God supernaturally hid it, even though they just heard it in plain language. They weren't supposed to know. And so he hid it from them. So I think I mentioned the last statement. So why did all this happen? For our benefit for our benefit. Now we can see that he knew exactly what was coming, but on the other hand, the twelve didn't. They didn't know they were going to crucify him. And when he was hanging on the cross, they had no idea that he would be raised from the dead. And we showed that in John's Gospel. When they saw the evidence at the tomb, then verse 20, I think it is, in, in chapter 20 says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They didn't know. Why? God kept all these things secret. Totally secret. Until we get to the apostle of the Gentile. All right, so back to Colossians chapter 1. This is what he's talking about. That even though these things may have been in veiled language, it still wasn't understood by anyone. Because God didn't expect them to. It wasn't time to understand it. All right? So verse 26 again, this mystery, this secret, <clears throat> which has been hid by God from ages and generations. But now, through this apostle, these things are made manifest to the saints. The unbelieving world still can't get it. But we who believe have the Holy Spirit's unction to understand now, we can make sense out of the whole thing. All right, now then, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, this singular one. There are many, but now we're talking about this one, this singular mystery. And what is it? Among the Gentiles, which is Christ, in you, the hope of glory. Now, we just read that casually. We think, well, so what? But now, wait a minute. Did the Gentiles have any idea of this kind of a relationship with the God of Abraham? Why? They didn't even know who he was. They didn't know who Jehovah was. Oh, they know who Zeus was and Apollos and all the gods and goddesses of Canaan. But to know the God of Israel? No, he was totally unknown. In fact, I knew I'd get to it sometime this afternoon. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> I always have to wait for the opening, but here it comes. Ephesians chapter 2. 
Verse 11 and 12. Now, I know people probably almost grin at me when I make some of these statements and think, well, that's just your idea. No, it's what the book says. If it's my idea, I always say so. Now, I said, this is what I think. But these things, no. This is what the Word of God says. These Gentiles had no idea of anything concerning the God of Israel. Nothing. All right, verse 11. And he's writing to Gentiles up at Ephesus. And so it's a Gentile letter. Wherefore, remember, call to mind, that you, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, that is, by genealogy and by birth, who are called uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision in the flesh made of the hand. In other words, Jews referred to Gentiles as the uncircumcised. Now look at verse 12. And again, this is plain language. That at that time, while Israel was still under God's covenant relationships, they were the chosen nation. <coughs> that at that time, you, Gentiles, were without Christ or a Messiah, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You had no part in Israel's dealings with God. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You see what that means? They had no part in those covenant relationships. None. Having no hope. That's why they were all steeped in paganism. That's all they knew. And they'd offer those animals by the thousands and turn around with all their immoral activity and thought that they were somehow ready for whatever eternity they were looking for. And remember, even the pagans were looking for an eternal life one way or another. That was not a biblical alone concept. They all had that idea of the afterlife. All right? But they were without hope because all they had was the gods and goddesses of mythology. And they were without God in the world. Now, do you have to be a seminary graduate to understand that? That's plain language. That was the lot of the non-Jewish world. They had no concept of the God of Scripture. They had no concept of the God of, of Israel. All right? Now then back to Colossians. And then all of a sudden to realize that the God of Israel Israel is going to indwell you and I as a Gentile? Absolutely. That's the promises now. Christ in us and we in Christ. That's the relationship that we enjoy. And that's why we don't have to have a works religion. My goodness, we've got something 10,000 times better. All right, Christ in you, the hope, the hope of glory, eternity whom we preach, Paul says, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. He didn't just pick and choose. He didn't say, well, now, I'd rather go to you wealthy people because, after all, you're, you're a little easier to get along with than those poor people down there in the slums. No. Paul never differentiated rich or poor, black or white, made no difference. All right? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. See? What wisdom? The Holy Spirit wisdom. That we may present every man perfect or spiritually mature in Christ Jesus. That relationship. All right. We're unto I also labor. How do we get into Christ Jesus? Now we've got three minutes left. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 and 13. Because this is a concept that is pretty hard to comprehend. Do I have to do something to become part of Christ? Like I said in the last program, are you going to have to swim a raging river? Are you going to have to collect a million bucks? No. It's all free for the taking the moment we believe what Christ has done on our behalf. 
All right, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body, the human body, it's one, but hath many members. My goodness. In fact, I was just looking at something last night, and I told Iris, says, how in the world can any medical professional person not be a believer? I can't comprehend it. When they see how wonderfully made this body is, how can they not believe? But anyway, Paul is using it as an analogy. Even the miracle of our body, the fingers and the toes and the eyes and all the things that make us up. And we have many members and all the members are one body. Being many, they're one body. So also is Christ. All right, now we're talking about the body of Christ. Every one of us who are a true believer, we are in a composite body of Christ and he is the head in the heavenlies. All right, now verse 13. Here's how we got there. For by one Spirit, a work of the Holy Spirit, we are all, every believer, has been baptized into the one body, the body of Christ. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, see, that's the whole scope of the economic status. Whether you're at the bottom or the top, makes no difference. We have been all made to drink or partake into one spirit, the Holy Spirit. All right, only got a minute left. Turn back quickly to Ephesians again. <clears throat> Chapter 4. And we come into this body of Christ by believing the gospel, plus nothing. And there is only one body. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 4. My, this makes it so explicit. There is one body, not 1,500 like there are denominations. There's one body, one spirit, only one Holy Spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Now look at verse 5 and 6. One Lord, one and only Lord, one faith, one baptism, the one we just read about, when the Holy Spirit places us into this body of Christ. And then one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. That's where we are. We're positioned in the very Godhead of Heaven itself. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all